Good morning, afternoon, or evening to folks tuning in from around the world. As a tradition, why don't you let us know where you're tuning in from? Welcome to the Kiskit Quantum Seminar. And just a reminder, this seminar takes place every Friday at noon Eastern time and will be hosted on this Kiskit YouTube channel. You can always subscribe to go back and catch up on anything you missed. We can only ask questions here live now during the seminar. I'm Derek Wong, a research scientist at IBM Quantum, and I'll be your host today. And of course, there's a lot of care and effort that goes into these seminars. So I'd also like to thank our producer, Zlaku Manev, video producer, Paul Searle, and managing producer, Olivia Lanes. Today, we'll be hearing a talk by Matthew Fisher, who will speak about quantum many body theory in the quantum information era. Matthew Fisher received his PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and then joined IBM actually for seven years. Matthew then went on to the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics, Microsoft's Station Q, and finally, UCSB, where he is now. Among many awards, Matthew Fisher received the Alan T. Waterman Award and the Oliver E. Buckley Prize. He's also a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Academy of Sciences. Take it away, Matthew. Okay, thank you so much, Derek. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and um, tell you a little bit about some things I've been thinking about really for the last four or five years. Um, I'd like to give you kind of an overview of those and then look a little bit more forward. So the title is Quantum Many Body Theory in the Quantum Information Era, uh, and then Monitoring Quantum Dynamics. Okay, so I'm a condensed matter theorist who has been doing many body quantum theory for a number of decades now. And in traditional many body theory, as I'll just remind you, uh, one's typically looking at equilibrium phases of quantum matter in solids. But in the last four or five years, I've been focusing on uh, more uh, quantum dynamical systems, and in particular, a uh, novel type of monitoring uh, for dynamical systems, which I will contrast with open system uh, dynamics. Um, and we'll be focusing on the behavior of quantum trajectories, which I will de describe uh, shortly. And one of the main things I want to tell you about is a rather interesting measurement-induced phase transition, um, which has a very rich theoretical structure that suffers from what we call the post-selection problem. Um, and I'll tell you what that is, uh, and then we'll talk about how attempts have been made to decode the post-selection problem, and uh, also uh, attempts to steer to novel uh, steady states using adaptive uh, dynamics. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, so quantum matter and universality. You know, one of the beautiful things about a quantum matter is that emergent phases, collective phases have properties that are independent of the microscopic details. So consider a crystalline solid, um, any crystalline solid, no matter what the uh, constituents are, what the atoms are, uh, will support quantized phonon excitations, both in acoustic and in optical uh, phonon modes. And so this is a, an example of universal behavior, which comes in when one has many interacting degrees of freedom. Likewise, in a superconductor, any superconductor that's worth its salt uh, will exhibit a Meissner effect and zero resistance when it is cooled down. Uh, an external applied magnetic field will be, will be uh, expelled from the superconductor below the transition temperature, and that's universal. In thin two-dimensional electron gases at low temperatures and in high magnetic fields, one has the phenomena of the fractional quantum Hall effect. And here, the fractional quantum Hall effect will support excitations with, with fractional charge. And again, this is independent of the material uh, that the uh, two-dimensional electron gas is, is in. Okay, next slide, please. So before I turn to quantum dynamics, let me just mention the approach to quantum matter uh, theory. Uh, typically, we analyze simple Hamiltonians, like the one shown on the top of the slide, uh, which is a Heisenberg spin model describing could be electron spins in a, in a magnetic insulator. And in quantum matter theory, we focus on ground states, and if not ground states, on thermal equilibrium states, where the density matrix is just uh, e to the minus beta h, which is the Hamiltonian. And we characterize the universal behavior of quantum phases and phase transitions, usually by order parameters. Um, for example, in a ferromagnet, the order parameter would be the magnetization. 
uh, which is uh, whose value is equal to trace of the spin times the density matrix in equilibrium. That would be the e equilibrium magnetization. Okay, and next slide, please. But in the last five or 10 years, there have been a number of new experimental platforms beyond the system of, of electrons in uh, and electron spins in crystalline solids. And these are the uh, NISC era, noisy intermediate scale quantum computers. And of course, these of you, those of you who are familiar with these will enjoy hearing this. So in the IBM or Google superconducting qubit arrays, uh, one has systems where one has, you know, people have built, uh, you know, re really quite remarkable quantum computers, uh, which one can explore uh, dynamical phenomena on. And that's what uh, we'll be you know, talking about. Another platform is ultra-cold atoms, uh, cooled down to very low temperatures, nano-Kelvin scales uh, in optical lattices. Um, a beautiful platform are uh, trapped ions, uh, and a number of uh, companies and labs around the world have very sophisticated uh, quantum processors in uh, trapped ions. And perhaps more recently, um, in the context of uh, at at atoms, are Rydberg atoms, uh, where one has optical tweezers which grab a hold of each atom and one can, uh, through laser manipulation, uh, implement uh, gates, uh, unitary gates between uh, neighboring uh, atoms in two optical tweezers. So the bottom line is that the new experimental platforms uh, open up uh, the new uh, possibilities for many body uh, quantum physics. And that's what I'd like to uh, describe. So next slide, please. Okay, so what are the why new opportunities of a quantum antibody theory? So on the left column, we have the quantum matter. Uh, uh, so for example, the quantum Hamiltonian uh, up in the upper left uh, that I was uh, mentioning. Um, now that will be replaced by a quantum circuit on the upper right, where time runs in the vertical direction and the blue boxes are two qubit uh, unitary gates, um, and the dots might measure, might uh, denote uh, measurements being made. Uh, so theoretically, one will be starting to analyze quantum uh, circuits. And rather than looking at ground states in equilibrium, one will be focusing on non-equilibrium dynamics driven by the experimentalist who is running the quantum computer. Uh, the system will be open uh, it would be an open quantum system, typically. Um, and what I really want to focus on in this talk primarily is the role of measurements uh, in, in such uh, quantum uh, processes. And theoretically, rather than looking at order parameters like the magnetization in a ferromagnet that I was mentioning before, one would look, one would choose to consider quantum informa information theoretic uh, quantities uh, like the uh, entanglement entropy. And here I want to emphasize that the entanglement entropy is nonlinear in the density matrix. The density matrix is rho here, and the entropy is trace of rho log rho. And that should be contrasted with the order parameter, um, in uh, uh, which is linear in the density matrix, so the magnetization order parameter. So I want to start talking about quantum circuits and entanglement and measurements in quantum circuits. Uh, so next slide, please. So the simplest quantum circuit consists of a single qubit uh, with the Hilbert space, which is two dimensional, the two states zero and one, uh, which can be placed in some linear combination of those two uh, basis states. And one thing that one can perform on these quantum processes are unitary gates, um, single qubit unitary gates, two qubit unitary gates. Uh, here's illustrated on the top, a single uh, uh, qubit unitary uh, gate. Time running to the right now, uh, U uh, denotes the uh, unitary, which could be um, uh, Pauli, sum of Pauli's, for example, I've taken here X plus Z. But in addition to being able to implement dynamics via unitary gates, uh, it's possible to perform measurements uh, on the scale of the individual qubits. It's possible to measure single qubits. 
And when one makes a measurement, uh, the there is a collapse. Um, so if the qubit is in the state alpha zero plus, or excuse me, a zero plus b one, uh, once a projective measurement is made of the z component of spin, uh, a result will be will emerge. It will be either zero or one. And these I'm going to call quantum trajectories. Um, and uh, a seek, if you make sequences of measurements, one has a, a quantum trajectory that one can follow. Um, and uh, what we will emphasize in this talk is that not only the important role of measurements in pulling out information, but the important role of measurements in modulating the quantum dynamics itself. I mean, unitary evolution is one, is one uh, part of quantum mechanics and measurements is the other. And we're going to see that measurements can modulate quantum dynamics. Okay, Derek, next slide, please. Okay, so I want to now go from one qubit uh, to many qubits and first talk about a closed system. And so here is a schematic of a quantum circuit with L qubits, time running in the vertical direction. Um, and the red uh, boxes are uh, two qubit uh, unitary uh, gates. Uh, and on the bottom, one inputs some initial state, which could be uh, and I'll consider this an unentangled product state in which every qubit is in the zero state. If one then implements the circuit, which one can do on a quantum computer, uh, evolving the qubits with, let's say, random two qubit unitary gates and run the circuit for long times, one gets an output state, psi out. Next slide, please. Now, the input state is unentangled. Uh, and if we consider the entanglement entropy, which is trace of row log row, the entanglement entropy is zero. There is no entanglement of the input state. But what about the output state? Well, one can then look at the entanglement of some subregion A, depicted up in the top right in blue, uh, in the, um, in, 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 of the output qubits, and look at the final reduced density matrix on region A, rho sub A, and look at the entanglement entropy of the final state uh, uh, S out subscript A, looking at basically the entanglement of the qubits in A to those qubits outside of A. And typically what happens in such unitary dynamics is entanglement spreads ballistically. And at long times, one gets what's called the volume law entanglement entropy, where essentially everything is, is entangled with everything else. So this inexorable increase of entanglement entropy is directly analogous to that in thermodynamics where it's entropy that always increases. Um, and that is uh, interesting to note, but high entropy means disorder, means little structure, and that in and of itself is not interesting. Uh, so one thing I've been trying to think about in the last four or five years is really how to control this growth of entanglement. And the way we uh, are going to be focusing on in this talk is using uh, measurements. Next slide, please. So let me talk a little bit about entanglement and measurements. So consider our favorite quantum information couple, Alice and Bob. And let's say Alice and Bob share a Bell pair. That is, they each have one qubit, and those two qubits have been entangled in a, uh, in a Bell pair state. Now, before a measurement, the entanglement entropy S sub A or S sub B uh, quantifies the degree of entanglement between Alice's qubit and Bob's qubit, and it will be log two in the bell pair state. So they're entangled, their qubits are entangled. But now let Alice measure the Z component of a spin. And what she will do is find, let's say the spin is up. Well, then Bob will find his spin is up, or conversely, Alice could have found her qubit to be spin to be down, in which case Bob's would also be down. But in either case, for either result of the measurement, the entanglement has uh, uh, been destroyed. Uh, Alice up, Bob up is a direct product state. There's no entanglement. So the entanglement after, me after measurement is zero. And this is a very general feature of measurements is that after making projective measurements, the average entanglement entropy is smaller than the entanglement entropy of the system before making the measurement. So local measurements induce 
disentanglement. And because of this, we are going to think about trying to in control entanglement growth via local measurements. And once we're thinking about making measurements, we really do have an open uh, system because the experimentalist has to come in and uh, start making start making measurements. Next slide, please. So I want to emphasize that there are really two classes of open quantum systems, ones uh, which would normally be described as decoherence and the other uh, in the bottom half of the slide as a monitored quantum system. So let's consider the decoherence first. Here, one imagines qubits that are coupled to some bath, other quantum mechanical degrees of freedom. And even if the uh, quantum system of interest, let's say the qubits in a quantum computer, are prepared in an initial pure state, uh, that density matrix, the pure state density matrix, rapidly becomes mixed as it entangles with the bath. And the information is lost, generally, into the environment, lost for good. And the density matrix evolves theoretically, one can describe it at least with the Markovian bath as the Lindblad equation. Now, what happens when we have a quantum system like this, which is you know, coupled and decohering uh, and losing information into a bath, is that universal uh, phenomena like phases and phase transitions, which one might be interested in in the many qubit systems, the, they will generally behave classically. Decoherence washes out quantum, inf quantum uh, phenomena, quantum dynamics. And so in that sense, uh, we really want to fight against decoherence. And of course, when one's trying to use a quantum computer you know, for anything practical, decoherence is the bane uh, of the experimentalist. One has to try to control that. And it's basically because the quantum mechanics is, is, uh, is uh, washed out uh, when one has uh, excessive decoherence. Okay, the second type of open quantum systems uh, we call a monitored systems. And here it's been monitored by an observer. And one can think of the observer as being the experimentalist measuring the, uh, the qubits in the uh, quantum uh, processor. Uh, here, if the quantum bits or qubits are prepared in an initial pure state and uh, projective measurements are made, the density matrix stays pure. One just really has a pure wave function. And we're imagining that the observer or the experimentalist keeps track of the measurement outcomes. And depending on the measurement outcomes, one has different quantum trajectories. So one has a collection of pure state wave function quantum trajectories. And uh, illustrated here, uh, so when it has an ensemble of wave functions, psi 1, psi 2, psi 3, and psi 4, for example, um, and it's looking, and what we're going to do is look at the properties of these pure states, look at the typical prop properties of one of the pure states, psi 1, psi 2, psi 3, or psi 4. And it's there that one has this rather remarkable phenomenon of the measurement-induced phase transitions that can occur. So next slide, please. So let me say a little bit more about quantum trajectories and decoherence versus monitoring. When one's looking at decoherence, one considers... Uh, the density matrix, which is a trajectory average density matrix, <clears throat> some on PM, uh, psi M, psi M. And here, average observables are linear in the density matrix. <coughs> Excuse me. So the expectation value of some operator is trace of rho bar O. And as I've already mentioned, quantum effects are largely washed out. In monitored systems, the density matrix is conditioned on the measurement outcomes. And I've written that rho sub M, M is for the measurement outcomes. And that's a pure state. It's one of the pure states, one of the pure state quantum trajectories. And one considers the entanglement entropy of the wave function trajectories, trace of rho A log rho A. And this is, of course, nonlinear in the density matrix. And then one can imagine averaging the entanglement entropy over the different quantum trajectories. So one's averaging a nonlinear quantity of the density matrix over the quantum trajectories. And it's these monitored quantum trajectories which reveal entanglement phases and phase transitions, uh, which I want to now turn to. So let's consider uh, a system of many qubits uh, in which, uh, shown on the right, time is again running vertically. Uh, and here now the two qubit unitary gates are in blue, and they cause entanglement, as we saw. Uh, but now we are punctuating that with these yellow single qubit measurements. Um, and while the unitary evolution induces entanglement growth, the qubit measurements 
uh, puncture the system in some sense. They induce disentanglement, as uh, the description, as the example with Alice and Bob's bell pair. And so, what is interesting to do is explore the competition between the unitary evolution, which entangles, and the measurements, which tend to disentangle. And we do that by following uh, the wave function quantum trajectories. Is there a next slide, please? And it's here that we find a remarkable entanglement transition in such monitor dynamics. We call this monitor dynamics because of a sequence of repeated measurements are being made on the quantum system. And as I emphasize again, the quantum dynamics is being modulated by the very act of making the measurements. The making the measurements isn't just to get information about the system, it's to modulate and modify the quantum dynamics. So let's consider the simplest, what I call a vanilla circuit, uh, which I've shown again here, where the two qubit unitaries are random, random two qubit unitary gates, and we're making single qubit measurements, and we'll choose to make those measurements with some probability uh, p, where p is some number between zero and one, and, um, and as I said, we're gonna start with an initial pure state and imagine running this uh, circuit with these unitaries and measurements and considering the long time entanglement entropy or the bipartite entanglement entropy. So there's only one parameter, P, which is in the interval zero to one. And we can ask about what is the, what are the behavior of the quantum trajectories at long times? What is the universal behavior? That is, what is the phase diagram? So we've already seen that if it's P is equal to zero, so no measurements are weighed whatsoever, entanglement inoxidably grows and we get boiling law entanglement. Whereas if P is equal to one and we're making very, very, very many measurements, we're completely disentangling the system. And then one has what's called area law entanglement, which just gets a little bit of entanglement across the cut, uh, the edges of the cut in this region A. And we anticipate, and even though this was controversial initially, that there might be a transition then at some uh, finite value of P, PC, separating the volume law phase in which everything is very entangled to the area law phase with, where the measurements are dominating and it's uh, disentangled. Uh, so this is um, uh, the suggestion of an entanglement uh, transition. Next slide, please. And so one way to try to look at this entanglement transition is numerically using uh, Clifford uh, circuits, hybrid Clif Clifford circuits with single qubit unitaries and two qubit, two qubit unitaries and single qubit measurements, excuse me. Um, and these Clifford circuits are very nice because one can simulate them on a classical computer for many, many qubits, uh, up to you know 500 or more qubits. And so that's done for this uh, vanilla circuit. Uh, Clifford circuit uh, shown here is on a log-log plot is the entanglement entropy of the final quantum trajectories, average over the quantum trajectories, uh, S sub A versus the L sub A, which is the size of this region A. And the upper curves um, are when one has volume law entanglement. Uh, and as one increases the measurement rate, uh, the entanglement goes down and one has an area law entangled uh, phase. Um, you know, so this confirms the phase diagram that I had on the previous uh, slide. Uh, the black curve there is what we think is the transition between the volume law phase and the area law phase. And we can identify the location of the transition, not just by eyeballing uh, the picture I was, as shown here, but as illustrated on the next slide, uh, please, Derek. Thank you. So one can look at something which is a bit like the entanglement attribute, which is called the mutual information. and the circle shows the a system of uh, qubits uh, with here periodic boundary conditions. Um, and one's divided that into three regions, a region A, a region B, and the rest. And one's looking at the mutual information between A and B, which is essentially a measure of how correlated or how entangled A is with B. Um, and one can argue that in the area law phase, um, where there is only short range entanglement, and since A and B are well separated from one another, uh, the mutual the entanglement entropies are all very small and the mutual information is very small and in fact goes to zero uh, as L goes to infinity. One can also argue that in the volume law phase, since everything is entangled with everything else, uh, 
and there are more qubits that are not in regions A and B, uh, that A and B themselves end up not having much, you know, sharing much information. And so the mutual information vanishes in the volume law phase as well. But right at the transition, uh, there is there are correlations between A and B, the regions A and B, or the qubits in regions A and B. And there's a non-zero uh, and constant mutual information right at PC. And so we can then just see the peaks in this uh, curve of the mutual information versus P. Um, as the system size gets bigger from size 64 up to 512, uh, the peaks get narrower and narrower. And we anticipate that as L goes to infinity, the peak will have essentially no width whatsoever. Uh, but in any event, we this enables us to identify the location of the transition, that is the value of P, uh, where the transition uh, takes place. Um, as illustrated on the next slide, please, we can rescale these, uh, these different uh, curves or different system sizes, uh, as you can see on the horizontal axis, when it's taken P minus PC times L to some uh, one over nu, nu is an exponent, and once collapsed, all of these curves on top of one another. So this is what one does typically in uh, equilibrium uh, thermal phase transitions. When one does, uh, when one when one has universal properties emerging, one can do uh, a data collapse and see essentially finite size scaling works very well um, as it does here. So I really should emphasize that this entanglement transition has universal phenomena uh, that's emerging here in the system of many uh, qubits. Uh, next slide, please. So once we've identified the value of P, namely PC, where the phase transition occurs, uh, we can look at the entanglement entropy versus system size L sub A versus the region length A. Um, and here one's plotted on a semi-log plot uh, and gets a straight line. Uh, so this tells us that right at the critical point, the typical quantum trajectory has an entanglement entropy which grows logarithmically with the size of the region that one's looking at entangling with the rest of the system. So the entanglement entropy goes as log L sub A. And there's some exponent uh, alpha C, which is around 1.6. And now this logarithmic scaling entanglement entropy, uh, in fact, is what one finds for ground states of one dimensional quantum spin chains, let's say, which are uh, tuned to be at a phase transition, a quantum phase transition, uh, and which are described by what is called the conformal field theories. And indeed, this uh, entanglement transition, this measurement-induced entanglement transition that we've been focusing on, um, the theoretical description of this is in terms of a conformal a field theory. Um, OK, next slide, please. Now, this entanglement transition has many hats. It can be viewed in many, many different ways. Uh, as we've seen, it's one way is viewing it as a, a transition between the entanglement properties of the quantum trajectories at late times between volume law and area law. But it can also be viewed as a, a purification transition, as emphasized by Michael Gullins and David Hughes. So here, rather than starting with a pure state, one starts uh, in a maximally mixed state. Um, one can start, for example, the density matrix is proportional to the identity, um, and then runs the circuit. Now, when one uh, runs the circuit, unitary dynamics doesn't change. Um, I mean, the, the, the density matrix and the entropy of the density matrix in any way. But when one starts taking measurements, one starts reducing the entropy. One starts removing information and reducing the entropy. And what one can do is imagine computing now the thermal entropy, trace of rho log rho at some late time t, and asking how much entropy has been removed by the measurements that have been taking place. And in this phase diagram here, when p is bigger than pc, which was the disentangled phase, uh, we see that the <clears throat> it becomes a pure phase that the entropy is is diminished to zero. So basically, um, all of the information is pulled out by the measurements. Uh, on the contrast, uh, for p less than pc, um, which was the entangled phase, that phase stays mixed with some entropy, which is 
uh, in, which cannot be accessed by making a measurement. So that's the, the mixed phase. So the purification transition occurs at the same value as the entanglement transition. And really it is the same transition. The difference is that in the entanglement transition, one starts with a pure state, a pure wave function, and then looks at the entanglement properties of the long time corner trajectories. Whereas the pure purification transition, one starts with a mixed state and looks at the purification properties. Uh, but they're really two sides of the same coin. Next slide, please. But this coin that I'm talking about actually has a third side, which is, which is viewing the mixed phase in the purification transition as a quantum memory, as a dynamical quantum memory. So here, what I want to imagine doing uh, is taking uh, some reference qubits labeled by R and entangling them with the system qubits, um, the L system qubits. Um, and if one runs the L system qubits through a random unitary circuit, the information which is encoded in R is hidden uh, very well. This is a hiding of information. And this was emphasized by Patrick Hayden and John Preskill a number of years ago. Now, what we're doing though, is we're running a unitary system uh, and we're making projective measurements. And um, what one can do is ask, you know, does that, do those projective measurements uh, pull out and uh, information that was encoded uh, when one entangled with the reference qubits? Um, so we can take the given output state, rho sub m, m is the measurement results, and we can define what's called a code distance. So the code distance uh, tells one uh, the size, the maximum si length of number of qubits, A, which one can uh, measure and uh, leave the uh, mutual information between A and R to be actually equal to zero. So if one makes measurements on the number of qubits less than D, one doesn't destroy the quantum information. The local measurements on A have no effect on the in in entropy of R. So in the mixed state, the mixed phase is stable if this co-distance uh, goes to infinity for L going to infinity. Uh, and it does, in this case, the co-distance in the mixed phase goes as L to the one third. Uh, and so in the phase diagram at the bottom of the slide, uh, one can uh, talk about the uh, volume law entangled phase, the mixed phase, and now we can call it a coding phase which is a finite code rate and a code distance, which turns out goes as L to the one third. And the area law phase, that, uh, which is the pure phase, is the non-coding phase. Okay, next slide, please. And these hybrid circuits that we've been talking about where one has unitary gates and punctuated with measurements um, can be analyzed in much more uh, interesting ways uh, beyond the vanilla circuit that I described one can make measurements of the what are called stabilizers in the two-dimensional toric code. <coughs> me. One can look at measurement only models where one makes multiple qubit measurements which are not commuting with one another. One can look at what are called symmetry enriched phases. Uh, one can consider U1 symmetric dynamics with unitaries and measurements and there in the in the volume law phase, there is actually two sub phases, a sharp, a charge sharp and a chart fuzzy phase, which is quite interesting. And one can look theoretically at these entanglement transitions in monitored free fermion chains where quite a little bit of analytic progress uh, can be uh, made. Next slide, please. Okay, so what I wanna focus on uh, now is a bit of the elephant in the room. I mean, I hope I've convinced you that in these monitored quantum dynamical systems with both measurements and unitary dynamics, the quantum trajectories reveal a very rich structure of entanglement. And it's, it's conceptually rich and theoretically rich, but is it experimentally accessible? And it's ha very hard to access this even on a decoherence-free quantum computer. And that's what I wanna describe why that is. So it's due to a so-called post-selection uh, problem. Um, as I already described, it's nonlinear functions of the quantum trajectories which reveal the transitions. Um, so, but imagine we now run the circuit on a quantum computer um, and 
when we'll get some measurement outcomes and we'll follow one quantum trajectory and maybe end up in the quantum trajectory, for example, psi two, if one runs the exact same circuit again, <clears throat> since the measurement outcomes are random, uh, when we'll end up maybe in a different pure state, maybe psi three. But in order to deduce the entanglement properties of a quantum state, of a pure state, one needs many copies of that state. It's similar to imagining, you know, if I were to give you uh, the ground state wave function of a quantum harmonic oscillator and say, measure the position of the particle, you measure it, you find it somewhere. And then I say, what's the wave function or what's the probability distribution? Well, you don't know. You need many copies of the same state. You need one copy, two copies, three copies, and you get statistical information when you measure many copies of the same state. But here the difficulty is in preparing uh, multiple copies of the same state. And the way one would have to do that is on post-selection. So one have to run the circuit many, many, many times and post-select, let's say, on the state side two. And so every time one ends up with state side two, one can do some measurement on it. Um, and then try to measure the entanglement entropy, for example, the entanglement of that state side two. Uh, using uh, tomography, for example, measuring the finite density, measuring the final density matrix. Um, now, this is a brute force uh, approach, which cannot scale with system size because it's exponentially unlikely in the number of measurements made to end up in the same quantum trajectory. But nevertheless, in a remarkable paper um, by Austin Minich at Caltech using uh, an IBM uh, quantum processor, uh, for small system sizes, they were able to uh, implement uh, a quantum circuit with, with uh, hybrid dynamics, making mid-circuit measurements and, and unitary gates, and both selecting and using tomography, and were able to uh, find some evidence for the measurement-induced phase transitions. Next slide, please. So what about other ways to overcome, to overcome post-selection? I mean, brute force is one way, which is not gonna work in the scalable limit. Uh, basically, it's necessary to use mid-circuit measurement outcomes. Um, otherwise, you know, it's hopeless. Um, and so one needs to take those mid-circuit measurement outcomes and do some sort of classical processing in those to decode the presence of the trajectory uh, transitions, the transitions in these quantum trajectories. And there have been a number of theoretical and experimental works which try to use a local probe and use classical decoding uh, to look at the measurement induced phase transition and one on a Google superconducting uh, processor from last year uh, was you know, fairly successful at doing that. Uh, but let me talk about this more generally. What one has to do is correlate the measurement outcomes with some classical computation, uh, uh, getting what are called classical quantum uh, estimators. Uh, and I want to describe a theoretical idea that we've been excited about called cross-entry benchmarking, uh, which should enable, in principle, one to access these measurement-induced phase transitions. Next slide, please. So what is the cross-entry benchmark? Well, this was the terminology used for random circuit sampling by the Google experiment from five years ago or so, where they declared quantum supremacy. Whether it's actual quantum supremacy or not is not the issue here. It's just, I want to describe what uh, their cross-entry benchmark was. Uh, here they were running a unitary circuit, a, a random unitary circuit, no measurements except at the very end. Uh, at the end, they make the measurements of all L qubits, and they end up with a bit string of length L, um, a set, set of bits. Uh, and then they, on a classical computer, they simulate the exact same circuit, and they compute what is the classical born probability that the, uh, the quantum system uh, would find that particular bit string x sub j. So they compute the probability p of x sub j. Then this is run many, many times. The quantum computer is run, bit string is accessed. Classical computer computes the probability that that bit string should have uh, occurred. Uh, and then one averages over those many runs and defines this quantity f cross entropy benchmark. Uh, now, if the quantum circuit was noiseless, it was a perfect quantum circuit, um, then f would be equal to one. That's how it's been normalized. Uh, 
but if the quantum circuit is strongly decohered, if it's very decohered, the cross entropy benchmark F would be a zero. And so they were able to try to see how big F could be. And what I recall is that they were finding pretty small values like 0.05. Um, but in any event, what's being done here is testing a quantum circuit you know, against classical simulations. Okay, so that's what we wanna to do to look at the measurement induced phase transitions. So next slide, please. So we're trying to decode the measurement induced phase transition via this cross entropy benchmarking idea. And the way it's done uh, here in this theoretical proposal uh, is we consider two identical circuits, the left circuit, uh, which we're gonna run on a quantum computer, uh, starting with some initial state rho, that could be all the qubits in the zero state, for example. And then on a classical computer, we're gonna run the identical circuit um, with the same unitaries, the same measurement locations, but with a different initial state, initial state sigma. And what we wanna do is compare the, the probability distributions of the measurement outcomes in, on the quantum computer with initial state rho to the classical computer with initial state sigma. So next slide, please. Yeah, so what we do is we uh, do what the Google, imagine doing what the Google experiment did, is we collect the measurement outcomes from the quantum computer, getting a bit string of these uh, mid-circuit measurements, that's M, and we're essentially drawing from the distribution um, piece of M rho with initial state rho. And for each of those bit strings, we compute on the classical computer uh, the probability that one would obtain those bit strings, except starting with a different initial state, sigma, on the classical computer. And so one computes classically P sub M as sigma. Next slide, please. And we can define an analogous quantity to the cross-entropy benchmark uh, that Google used, which in this case is a linear cross-entropy benchmark, uh, chi, whose definition is in the red uh, box there. It's been normalized so that if the probability distribution of the measurement outcomes on the quantum computer are, are the same as on the classical computer, even though the initial states are different, if the probability distributions of the measurement outcomes are the same, chi is equal to one. That's the uh, normalization. Um, if the, uh, that's how chi is, is normalized. So again, one imagines running the quantum circuit to get the measurement outcomes M, one uses the classical circuit to compute the probability with a different initial state that when we get that measurement outcome repeats many times and computes chi. And in principle, there's no need for post-selection or tomography. Uh, there is need for this decoding of these using the classical computer in this way. Next slide, please. So what we have done is implemented <coughs> this, not quantum versus classical, but classical versus classical. Um, so we use a classical simulation with Clifford circuits with two different initial states, rho and sigma, and look at the cross entropy uh, of the probability distributions of the measurement outcomes between these two different initial states. And what's shown here on the vertical axis is chi versus uh, p. Uh, and one sees that, uh, let's look at the largest system size, that's the red uh, squares where L, of, L is 512. Uh, one sees it's, you know, when chi is near one, then it drops down rather steeply to chi of around 0.65. Uh, and this value of P where it drops down is the location of the entanglement transition in the monitored quantum circuit. Um, and uh, as a function of the different system sizes, one sees uh, signatures of the, uh, you know, the critical properties of that measurement induced phase transition as uh, the, the different curves all crossing at one value of PC. So the cross entropy reveals two phases and the measurement induced phase transition. Hi Matthew, we have a quick question here um, asking about if there is a uh, more physical interpretation of the cross entropy measure for physical systems or? Yeah, so let me, next slide. And I think hopefully I'll answer that question. Thank you. Well, okay, so th this is just to, to summarize. I mean, it's the next, next, next slide. <laughs> so I'll come to that in a second. Um, well, okay, so he here's a way to try to think uh, uh, physically about this. Um, so uh, imagine Alice is inputting some quantum state. It could be rho or sigma. 
and running it through a unitary circuit, uh, you know, that's the dynamics. And Eve is secretly making measurements uh, and pulling out classical information. And Bob is getting the, uh, the, the final quantum uh, state. Now, the question is, uh, is uh, the message that Alice is encoding in rho or sigma, the two different initial states, is that being accessible? Is that even in principle accessible to Bob? Or has the information been so degraded by Eve that no information gets through? Now, if Eve makes lots of measurements, then the information is degraded and not all the information gets through. And that's in the area law phase. Now, in the volume law phase, Eve is making infrequent enough measurements that all of the information gets through. The probability distribution uh, function for the measurement outcomes that Eve is making is independent of the initial state, be it rho or sigma. So she's not able to get any information about the initial state. And that's in the volume law phase. And there, chi is equal to 1. So the transition where chi goes from 1 and drops down to something around 0.65 um, is a transition in the ability for this hybrid circuit to transmit uh, quantum information. So I hope that... Uh, that helps a bit. Um, next slide, please. Next slide. Thanks. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so uh, now in the real quantum computer, there would be depolarizing noise. There'd be de some decoherence. And so on a classical computer, we could simulate that a noisy classical circuit, a quantum circuit simulated classically and the noise-free quantum circuit simulated classically and look at the across entropy uh, benchmark uh, and in, in the and increasing the amount of noise going from the left panel to the right panel. And by the time you got to the right panel, the curves are no longer crossing. And so the uh, crossing point, which is the, the signature of the phase transition is getting washed out. So de decoherence will wash out this measurement induced phase transition. Now, um, Austin Minich and his collaborators are, have been, you know, um, setting up and are in progress in trying to uh, look for this, you know, measure the quantum cross entry benchmark on, an, on one of the IBM quantum simulators. And uh, that's work in progress. I hope paper will be written up uh, shortly, but um, nothing further to say about that right now. Hello? Uh, quick question, Matthew here. So when you increase the depolarizing probability, this transition is moving to a lower p critical. And could you interpret that physically? Why that is that? Why that's the case? Um. Well, I think. Uh, yeah. I mean, basically, um, I think all of the you know de decoherence basically just suppresses the the this cross entry benchmark independent of system size and um so uh you know if you have enough decoherence the big systems will be decohered more than the the sm smaller systems uh, and the curves won't cross so basically one is evolving from a situation where there's a crossing with no decoherence to a situation where there <laughs> is no crossing when it's very decohered and um, with you know, as the decoherence you know, shifts up, that crossing point, you know, shifts down. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Next slide. Thanks. Okay. So I've talked about decoding the measurement-induced phase transition, and I want to thank the audience for the two very good questions, by the way. Um, and um, what I want to say and talk about in the last five or ten minutes is <clears throat> what another thing one could do to try to overcome the post-selection problem, and that is using uh, steering of the monitor dynamics. So here one imagines the experimentalist measuring the quantum computer, taking the measurement results and performing some classical computation, just as I was describing, but then using that classical information to, uh, com to determine a conditioned feedback into the quantum computer, and then run this cycle around and around. And the question can be, what kind of novel quantum dynamical phases can you access by doing this. Now, this scheme is what one uses in, it tends to use in active quantum error correction, where one you know, measures the stabilizers and trying to see what errors have been made. And then one 
uh, compute, you know, the best way to try to, you know, eliminate those errors. But I want to ask a little more generally about the novel quantum dynamics that one can access uh, with such a, a, a scheme. Next slide, please. So I'll just describe one uh, work that we did uh, really recently um, where we uh, followed such adaptive uh, quantum dynamics, this is theoretic, theoretical work, uh, with a continuous, which has a continuous symmetry breaking. Uh, and here uh, we have a one dimensional system of qubits measuring, taking a pair of qubits randomly and measuring the swap operator across the two sites. Uh, the swap operator's eigenvalues are plus one or minus one. If the eigenvalues are plus one, those two qubits are projected into one of the three even parity triplet states. If the eigenvalue is minus one, the two qubits are projected into an odd parity singlet state. And the adaptive feedback is uh, to, if one finds one of the th three even parity triplet states, if the swap uh, operator uh, eigenvalue is, is found to be plus one, one takes one of the two qubits and does a Z phase rotation, which changes the sign of the, uh, the triplet state uh, and uh, pumps, as I've shown here, the triplet state uh, into a, uh, excuse me, pumps the local singlet state into the, 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 the M equals zero triplet state. Uh, so this is the way to you know, measure whether there are singlets or triplets. If there are singlets, one make, turns them into a triplet and one just keeps going. Um, and next slide, please. And in this way, one is getting these measurement outcomes, but one is doing a condition response to the measurement outcome. So as one is in effect steering the quantum trajectories. And in this schema at long times, the quantum trajectories all converge onto a single quantum trajectory, a single pure state psi out. And since we have a single pure state, um, rather than a, a, a superposition of, of, many, of many different possible quantum trajectories, uh, we can use the uh, quantum channels rather than uh, you know, just, just monitoring alone. Uh, so the, the details of this aren't so important, but here I've shown uh, the, the basic definition of a quantum a channel where you input density matrix uh, is modulated by Krauss operators uh, and uh, where pi plus minus is the swap measurement operator. And this model uh, has a symmetry. Uh, it's called a U1 symmetry. Uh, the Krauss operators commute with the total Z component of the spin of all these one-dimensional qubits. Um, so that's called a strong symmetry. Um, and we've done some numerics on this model uh, using the, a doubled Hilbert space where one can define some non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. Details not so important, but next slide, please. Um, and uh, one can look at the dynamical steady states of this adaptive circuit. Um, and uh, the channel fixed point is the ground state, the, the steady state fixed point is the ground state of the Hamiltonian. And one finds indeed that the fixed state is pure and has maximal total spin because one keeps knocking the singlets into the triplets uh, and so one goes into a, a state with S total equals L over two, it's a maximum total spin. Uh, but since S total Z is conserved, one has to take that and project it into the uh, state with given SZ total, the initial is SZ total. So the steady state properties have long range order. There's a breaking of a continuous U1 symmetry, which is quite interesting. And this is not possible in a 1D equilibrium system, um, even at zero temperature. Uh, and the, uh, the entanglement entropy of the corner trajectory that emerges has log, log entanglement entropy. The next slide, please. And one can look at the approach to the steady state by looking at the gap of this non-emission Hamiltonian, which one gets from exact diagonalization. The gap goes as one over L squared. That gives a relaxation time going as L squared. And this is a signature of diffusion. So since there's a conserved U1 in this uh, adaptive quantum system one's looking at, uh, one's doing these swap measurements, feedback, swap measurements and feedback, the conserved charge, the U1 charge is diffusing around and that gives this uh, 
typical characteristic time going as L squared. So the conserved U1 gets slow diffusive dynamics. Next slide, please. And one can look at the stability of the ordered steady state. Uh, and here one's looking at what happens when we make single uh, qubit measurements. Uh, the steady state becomes mixed. It destroys the long range order and the diffusive dynamics so persists. Next slide, please. Uh, might this be experimentally accessible? Well, there's a, lot, a number of good features and then there's some challenging ones. The, the simple geometry is good. It's one dimension. One can put it up in this uh, geometry as I've shown in the upper right. Uh, the mid-circuit measurements, challenging but possible. The sim it's simple feedback, so that's good. It's local feedback. No post-selection post needed, that's good. But one does need a, a fairly deep circuit to access these dynamical steady states, and that's challenging. And if there's a lot of decoherence, or even maybe not that much decoherence, it could wash out. So it's not clear whether uh, it would be preferable looking at this on, on an iron trap or a superconducting processor, and it's not clear whether this is would be possible for large system sizes to see this in either either one, but th this is, I think is something that is worth uh, pursuing on the experimental uh, front. So next slide, please. Okay, so let me just uh, wrap up here. So I've been talking about monitored quantum dynamics, and the real take-home message here is that monitoring means making measurements. Making measurements isn't just pulling out information, it's modulating the dynamics. Making sequences of measurements gives you a novel type of dynamics. And in the quantum trajectories, we've seen these measurement-induced phase transitions, but they suffer from this post-selection problem. And uh, we've gone around this post-selection problem. Uh, um, one has to use the mid-circuit measurements to try to decode these measurement-induced phase transitions. And we've talked about the, the cross-entropy um, and uh, then finished by talking about the adaptive dynamics to try to steer to uh, dynamical uh, phases. And so the number of uh, questions in future directions, uh, we could talk about other decoding schemes. Uh, you can ask, is it possible to decode the vanilla measurement-induced phase transition with scalable classical processing? Uh, can one get adaptive dynamics to steer to stable mixed state symmetry-breaking phases? or accessing other novel quantum dynamical steady states. The next slide, please. OK, so that, let me just wrap up and thank my uh, collaborators who are all listed here. And let me just particularly single out Yao Dong Li, who was a former graduate student at UCSB and is now a postdoc at Stanford, and Jake Hauser, who's a graduate student at, um, at UCSB. Um, and uh, thank you for your attention. I appreciate it. Great. Thanks so much, Matthew. That was really interesting. There's actually a ton of questions kind of uh, bunched up in the chat here that uh, try to triage maybe in order of like more specific to, to more general, if that's okay with you. Sure. It's here. Yeah. So one of these questions is um, how critical are the random unitaries to this kind of work? I get the sense that any entangling unitaries would work and you'd be able to reduce overhead via simple ansatzes with nice analytic properties. And maybe I'll add my own flavor to that is um, you know, some studies are done with random unitaries. Some were done with Clifford's. Um, you know, is, does it matter the choice of the gates you put in between? Yeah. Thanks, Kelly. I think that's maybe you that asked the question. I see your picture there. So, um, so how critical are the random unitaries? Um, as far as the nature of the volume law phase, uh, the uh, pure, the impure phase, the coding phase, uh, the details of the unitaries is not important. Uh, you can take Clifford unitaries, you can take Haar random unitaries. It doesn't, doesn't matter. As far as the measurement induced phase transition itself, not its existence, but its universal properties, uh, they depend on the type of unitary. So with Clifford unitaries, we believe the universality class of that transition, critical exponents and so on forth, are going to be different than with, uh, you know, um, non-Clifford unitary gates. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, thank you. Um, another question we have here is by Bector earlier in the talk. Is it possible to extract the entanglement spectrum? And I think what they mean by this is you look at the entanglement entropy and whether it, you know, grows boundlessly or kind of converges. Um, is there a use to digging a little bit deeper into the entropy into the things that you average over to get the entropy. Yeah, so I mean, I think numerically, one, I mean, one has a pure state. One can construct the density matrix, um, and one can 
you know, diagonalize that and get the entanglement uh, spectrum. I mean, in that entanglement spectrum would can give one more than just the von Neumann entropy, but the Rennie entropies. And, you know, there's been efforts to compute the Rennie entropies as well. Um, you know, I, I mean, I think, you know, as far as measuring entanglement entropy, I mean, you, you really want to measure the density matrix. Um, if you want to calculate it directly and using tomography, um, and then once you have the density matrix in hand, you can look at the spectrum, you can compute the entanglement spectrum. Cool. Thank you. Um, we have another question, um, maybe a question about scalability here and also the need for, you know, some number of qubits on a device. Uh, a lot of experiments are up to 14 qubits, of course, but you show results up to 512 for certain kinds of gates. Um, but then I also noticed that a lot of the scaling curves kind of collapse with much fewer. And so overall, the question is how important are large system sizes and therefore how important are quantum computers with many qubits available? Yeah, well, um, one needs a number of qubits, which is large compared to one. Um, so 10 or 15 is probably good enough. And one can look at the classical simulations to see that that's the case. Um, but, you know, it a bit depends on the precise, you know, set of unitary gates and, and measurements you use. But since basically um, the unitary gates are two qubit unitary gates, which are local, the measurements are single unitary gates, so single measurement, single qubit measurements, which are local, there isn't a natural length scale, which is long, other than the correlation length, which emerges in the other transition. So, so I think... 10, 15 qubits, when we'll start seeing signatures of the um, of this transition, I think, you know, the, the more challenging is the decoherence ultimately um, than the number of qubits. But. I see. Thank you. Um, and maybe the final question I'll ask here, a little bit more open sky. The very last part you talked about this dynamical steering with uh, adaptive circuits. And to me, that just reminds me of quantum error correction effectively and, and trying to take out errors and converge to some uh, correct right. state. And so I guess, is there anything to learn from this and to apply to quantum error correction? Can you use the language of quantum error correction to inform the studies you're doing with these feed forward type circuits? Um, how do these two languages map onto each other? Yeah, bit. I mean, I think what we have is it, it's the same scheme as the quantum, active quantum error correction where you make measurements and you do active feed forward to try to correct the measurements and you try to keep near some pure state i mean maybe the ground state the code space of some uh, quantum uh, quantum code so i mean i think I'm, I'm not sure what we're doing will necessarily feed into into quantum error correction but what i want to do is to step back and say you know let's look more broadly at the types of quantum dynamical phases uh, that we can stabilize with this uh, paradigm of basically making measurements, class of computation, and conditioned feedback, um, not just to store quantum information, but just to make interesting phases. Maybe mm -hmm. there's new novel quantum dynamical phases that we can make, which are not accessible in equilibrium. And that would, the one example we had was a, a, a case of that. Um, so I think it just, you know, for me, conceptually, it just opens up the, the door to thinking more broadly about uh, possible, possible, you know, quantum dynamical steady states that, that might be accessible. Um, I see. That makes sense. I mean, maybe one way to map it is, or one way to analogize it to is like, depending on the scheme you use in your dynamical phase preparation, that could, res that's equivalent to having different code spaces or something like that, or? Yeah, well, certainly, I mean, if you dip look at different quantum error correcting codes, I mean, the, you know, what you measure to detect the errors and what the feedback is depends on the precise code, whether it's the toric code, the repetition code or something else, right? So, yeah. um, so there's a lot of freedom in what you measure and what the condition feedback is and how you do that. And I mean, that space is huge. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so th that's nice. So there's a lot of room to explore theoretically and, you know, hopefully experimentally as well. So, yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming in today. This was super interesting and we had a really active audience today. Um, so of course, a big thanks to the audience for tuning in. Uh, if you guys want to continue this conversation, hop over to the Kiskit Slack workspace there. Um, we post the videos, you can talk about them there. 
So like this video, subscribe to the Kiskit YouTube channel, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, audience, and thank you, Derek. I really appreciate it.